All right. Now I'm going to move to the last two points, and that is the three point, the, the three phases of persecution, and then our eight point game plan. All right. The three phases are really easy, folks. Phase one: they attack our Christian symbols and our signs. These come really in two styles: the cross. They hate the cross, the crucifix, the cross, and then statues and images and icons of Jesus, Mary, and the saints. We're seeing this ramp up. This was all over social media recently. I hate to even put it on the screen. It breaks my heart. It feels like a kick in the stomach or someone spitting a loogie on my face. But this, you have to know what people are doing. This is what people are doing to Catholic churches right now. Look at this picture. Horrible. That is the mother of Jesus Christ. We love our mothers more than all. The Ten Commandments say, Honor thy father and thy mother. That's the fourth commandment. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, 100% perfectly with all his divinity and all his humanity, honored his father, God the Father. Every Protestant will agree with you. Did Jesus perfectly honor his father? Every Protestant, oh yeah, perfectly. Then you tell your evangelical friend or your Protestant, okay, well, if Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law and the Ten Commandments, did he perfectly 100% with all his divinity and all his humanity honor his mother? Protestant may not be ready for that because they don't like to think that Mary would be important or special. But if Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man and he perfectly honors his father, he's going to perfectly honor his mother. And we who are called to be disciples and followers of Jesus Christ are also called to be honorers of the father, God the father, and honorers of his mother who is not a goddess. But she is the mother of God because her son is God, the son of God, Jesus Christ. In time, she bore in her womb, God. She nursed God at her breast. She is the mother of God. That's special. No other human had that kind of relationship with the Son of God, eternal logos. And she did. And look at these savages writing with spray paint, idol, on the womb of Our Lady. Look at that. I for idol, right on her womb. Disgusting. Sacrilege. At Fatima, you know, I'm always saying pray the rosary every day. Pray the rosary. If you don't pray the rosary, you're not on the team. At Fatima, Our Lady also said, fulfill the first five Saturdays because there are five sins against me. And I have a whole video on YouTube. After you watch this one, uh, search in YouTube, Taylor Marshall, five sins against Mary. One of those is desecrating the images of Mary. Think if I came into your house for dinner and I walked over to the mantle and there's a picture of your mother and your father on the mantle and I walked over, picked it up, threw it on the ground, stomped on it, pulled the picture out of the broken glass and began to rip it up and throw it into the fire. Would that honor you? Would that honor your home, your family, your legacy? No. So when people break statues of the saints who are the friends of Jesus or Mary who is the mother of Jesus or of Jesus Christ himself, the Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings, they are disgracing God and they're disgracing his family, which is called the church. And we can't accept it. Now, thanks be to God. This statue has already been cleaned. It's already been renovated. It's been restored. It's clean again, that nasty word is taken off of the womb and the dress of Our Lady. But this is phase one of the persecution against Christians. Phase one. We are in a war. We are in a war against Christianity. Phase two. They will attack the churches. They attack the symbols because they, you know, 
That's not real serious. Oh, I just broke a crucifix. I burned an icon. I spray painted, I'm gonna take this horrible picture down. I spray painted a statue of the Blessed Mother. But next they attack the churches. The churches signify Catholic people taking up space. This is our jurisdiction. This is our place. This is where we gather. This, the tower and the spire signify, which are often the highest point in a town. Hey, this is where God is. This is where the tabernacle is. This is where Jesus Christ lives amongst his people. And this is where they worship him. So they are going to attack that. That's higher stakes. And then phase three. They attack the people. They attack you. This is where you go to jail. This is where they come and they accuse you of hate crimes. Right now in Brazil, they are creating a board, a court, that can, that can convict you for influencing an election using religious hate speech. And guess what's on the list for religious hate speech? If that happened in America, all they would have to do is start reading Catholic books, Catholic authors, anyone who says anything that's against the cultural morality, those people would immediately be convicted. They'd be taken off. And then once the people are in prison, and by the way, the first ones to go are usually the clergy be the clergy and then it's the intelligentsia academics intellectuals not the ones who kowtow to the liberal agenda in the universities but the ones who stand up and say no i'm not going to go along with that i'm not going to, to sign that paper that document and they'll say well you're going to lose tenure and then a lot of people will back down and then you might go to prison a lot of people will back down but there'll be some people who won't back down and then they're going to come after the parents. Is it true that you teach your children Christianity? Is it true that you treat, teach your kids the Bible in a literal way? Do you teach them the sexual morality that's found in the Bible? That's a hate crime. That's child abuse. How could you be doing that? And then you go to jail. And then, after the prisons, then we get to martyrdom. This is the pattern you see in the Roman persecutions. I'm not making it up. This is not Taylor Marshall's theory or prophecy about the future. What do they do during the Diocletian persecution. First things first is they commanded that people bring forward scriptures, chalices, and the vessels used in the liturgies. That was the first thing. And sometimes even the clergy went to the authorities and said, here's our Bibles, here's our lectionaries, here's our chalices and all that. And they said, good little boy, you don't have to die today. So that was the first thing. They attacked the symbols and the statues. Now, in the persecuted church, they didn't have statues. Statues cost a lot of money, and you got to put them somewhere. You can't have a giant marble statue of St. Peter uh, in pre-Constantinian Christianity. There were images, by the way, usually murals in house churches. There are examples of them in history books. You can look them up. The early Christians were not iconoclasts. They had pictures of Jesus and the saints and Old Testament people, Daniel, Jonah, there's a famous mural of Jonah because they're all signs of Christ. But these things had to be handed over to the authorities and to the state. The next thing that they did is they went after the meetings. Where are you guys meeting? Okay, well, you can't meet there anymore. 
they come into the meetings, they take the people, they arrest them. And that leads, of course, to the final phase, attack of the people. It got to a point in Roman society where there was these things called certificates. And you had to sign a certificate that was notarized by your local authority that you had given one grain of incense to the genius of Caesar. There was a bust, a statue, an idol of Caesar. And everyone had to come forward. They would just take a little piece of incense out of a big bowl. And there was a thurible in front of the bust of the emperor. You would walk up with your one grain of incense, drop it into the thurible, which was on fire. That little incense would burn. And you would say, Kyrie Kaiser. O Lord Caesar. Kyrie Kaiser. We Catholics say, Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. They were called to say, Kaiser. Kurias. Kaiser is the Lord. Caesar is the God. And then to worship him with just a little grain of incense. Once you did that, you got your certificate. That way, if the police ever stopped you, or you ever got in any trouble, they say, hey, have you worshipped the Caesar? Oh yeah, I got my certificate. Some Christians who were wealthy were kind of crafty. So what they did is, like, I would never say that about Caesar, and I'd never worship Caesar with incense. So what I'll do is I'll bribe an official to forge a certificate for me and have it notarized. So if I ever get stopped, I can just show my fake certificate, and I will not commit sin against Jesus, and I'll have the certificate, and I won't get arrested. Well, guess what the bishop said? That's a mortal sin, too. You can't even carry a fake certificate because you're carrying around a certificate that says you committed apostasy. And that's a sin. Even those people had to do special penances in the early church. And then everyone who said, no, I'm not doing that, they were tortured and then they were killed. These are the Diocletian martyrs. Some of the greatest martyrs of all time. Many mystics say that the martyrs in the last days will excel over the Diocletian martyrs. That's something to think about. These are the great martyrs who went before us in the Roman times and suffered horrible tortures, especially the young ladies. Many of them taken to brothels where they would be repeatedly raped and disgraced because they held their virginity so high. Men in the military who were friends of Caesar, friends of the emperor, were betrayed by their own men and killed. I wasn't going to do this, but do I have it? I wrote a book, which I don't have in front of me, Sword and Serpent. It's a novel about St. George. It's a historical fiction of this whole time period. If you want to enter into the Diocletian persecution and know exactly what was happening and feel it in a fictional way, a historical fictional, fictional way, get my book Sword and Serpent. I go through the historical, here it is, boom. I use historical saints, historical situations, real generals, real people, and I retell this story of how the dragon, the demon of Roman paganism and persecution was destroyed by the love and the charity and the blood of the saints, led by, in this book, St. George, who's a historical person. And he did fight a dragon, but it's not the dragon that you might imagine. It's something far more preternatural far more sinister and far more evil. That's the climax and end of this book, Sword and Serpent. So those are the three phases. Attack the symbols of Christianity, attack the churches of Christianity, attack the people of Christianity. But the cool thing is, Catholics always win. This happened in the French Revolution. They took down all the, the images, the statues, the icons. Then they started attacking the churches and tearing down the churches. They even renovated... Notre Dame and made it into a temple of reason with the prostitute dressed up as reason personified. And then they began to kill the clergy and even the nuns and the people. And then once the blood began to flow, 
the Holy Ghost began to work and the revolution came to an end and Catholicism was reconstituted on French soil. So we always, we're the comeback people. We always come back because our king is crucified, died, and risen again. You kill, you kill us, the church comes back because that's our king. That's how he goes.